For early access plus exclusive content, facilitated discussions, live one-on-one Q&As, and more, become a patron at patreon.com slash brucepointset. Welcome back to the Blacktastic Adventure, a virtual exploration of Oregon's Black diaspora. I am your host, Bruce Poinsett, and we have a very special family edition today where I speak with my parents, William Bruce Poinsett and Bruce R. Poinsett. And I just want to say before I, you know, read off their intros for you that, you know, this was partially inspired by my interview with Richard Brown, which I encourage you to watch. And, you know, he really emphasized, you know, making sure you get this family history and make sure it's recorded and you don't take that knowledge for granted. So, you know, I want to, want to put that to, you know, put that into action. Anyways, let me, let me tell you a little bit about my parents. So okay. Willie points at my mother is the co-founder and president of Respond to Racism in LO. She is a retired school principal and central office administrator from Portland Public Schools. She previously worked as a teacher and principal for the Patterson Board of Education in New Jersey. She served 45 years as an educator before embarking on her new role as a community organizer. She was the recipient of the Lake Oswego Chamber of Commerce Community Leader of the Year Award in 2019 and the Justice and Witness Award from the Central Pacific Conference for the United Church of Christ. She lives in Lake Oswego with her husband, Bruce R. Poinsett. And Bruce R. Poinsett is an occupational safety consultant specializing in commercial, industrial, and civil construction. He was previously a safety consultant for the Associated General Contractors of America Liberty Northwest Insurance, and Oregon OSHA. He is a member of the Ainsworth United Church of Christ and past conference moderator of the Central Pacific Conference. He is a member and twice past president of the American Society of Safety Professionals, Columbia Willamette Chapter, as well as a member and twice past president of the Rotary Club of Southeast Portland. And with that, like I said, it was a, you know, a great conversation where I got to learn a little bit about my parents along with you know, a live uh, studio audience on Patreon. So I encourage you, if you're not a member and you want to be a part of future live episodes of the Black Tastic Adventure, as well as other events, become a patron or become a patron. And with that, let's uh, let's get into it. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Check it out. Well, mom, dad, uh, thank you for, you know, being the the guinea pigs for our special live family edition of the Black Tastic Adventure, how are you doing this afternoon? I think I'm doing okay. Uh, it all depends. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new experience for me, so <laughs> I, I feel powerful right now. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I, I can feel. I can feel the nerves. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't worry. I will not. I will not be too bad. I will not, you know, poke and pry too much. For the people who are watching this, they didn't hear me just before I hit record telling the audience something very different. But <laughs> I'm sure this will be a fun conversation. So, you know, I think this is going to be fun because it's an opportunity, you know, growing up. Obviously, I know some things about your story, but, you know, it's an opportunity for myself as well as others to kind of learn about you all you have you know coming from South Carolina to Oregon and you know we're not going to be able to cover every part of the story but I think you all just have like a lot of insights into just various areas of black life in this state and existence in this state that I think a lot of people could learn from so but first I just want to start it off with you know Mom, you grew up in Sumter. Dad, you grew up in Charleston. Can you just talk about, you know, what those respective areas were like growing up? Either one of you can start first. I will. I'll start. Um, As Bruce said, I grew up in or spent my earlier years in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, To two parents, my mother, Edith and my um, dad was Willis. I also had a half brother and sister, but I grew up out in the country. 
um, but closer to the city than when we moved another time, the second time. My uh, dad died in 1954. And so that was an early, um, it was an early time to lose my dad. And I was his heart and, you know, I what he spoiled me. And my mother married um, another man and we really moved out into the country. So I was with Jim Crow laws in a city, in a state where black folks could not look white people in the eyes. And so it was yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. And um, they, whites though, were able to call us by our first names. My mother, they called Edith, you know, and there was not any respect there for her as another adult. And so that was really hard. It was a segregated school, all black teachers, all black students. And so it was different mm. from when I moved to New Jersey. And you also had, you know, you also say you have memories of like actually, you know, hearing, seeing the Klan out at night, right? Oh, yes. You would hear the, um, well, I didn't look out the window, but you could hear the the horses when they would ride and then they would put a cross up, burn a cross in someone's yard when someone in the family there had done something. And um, as a community, you know, you knew that whoever it was, they were either going to get killed or they had to get out of town and away and hidden so that they would not be killed. So there was just that fear when, and the, doing something could be something as simple as um, looking at someone white. And for a man to look at a white woman, that was just a death sentence. So it mm -hmm. was really hard and you had to be respectful. Bruce yeah, Dad, 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 you talk about Charleston? Charleston was um, born in Charleston in 1946. Interesting time. But as I grew up, uh, learned a lot about the, the ways of Charleston. Charleston was a very interesting town. There was basically five classes of people that lived in Charleston. You had poor Blacks and poor Whites or you had what would have been classified as rich blacks, which is really middle class, and rich whites. And the military, because Charleston was a military industrial complex. And that had a lot to do with the makeup of the city. It also had a lot to do with law enforcement. If you were in the military and you were doing something wrong in Charleston, you hoped that the military police got there before the city police. Because if the city police caught you and you were black, you were in big trouble. Schools were segregated. Everything was uh, segregated. Your job opportunities for grown people were segregated. So you had a lot of black people with college degrees that worked for the post office or worked at the Navy Yard or at the Air Force Base. But they didn't have, you didn't have a big, uh, you didn't have a lot of engineers. You didn't have a lot of uh, business people as you do in other places. Um, a classic example, and I'll never forget this, one of the family friends, um, Elmo Sims, a uh, college degree, but he worked at the Greyhound bus station. And here was the funny thing about it. He could drive a Greyhound bus, a scenic cruiser, which in that era was a huge bus, he could drive it from the station to the sanitary landfill in Charleston so that they could empty the holding tanks and drive it back, bring it up to the station so it would be ready to take on passengers, but he could not become a Greyhound bus driver because he was black. And it wasn't until he was about 55 years of age that things cleared up and he became actually a bus driver that took that thing on the road. Um, and that's about the size of Charleston. It was just 
uh, heavy, like I said, heavily segregated and uh, very class oriented, even though it was a city. So opportunities were limited. You know, there's another thing about uh, my family. I had another brother that my mother um, raised, uh, not formally adopted, and he got himself into trouble. Um, fast driving or looking at someone that he shouldn't have been looking at or they thought it thought he did. And he spent a lot of time on the chain gang. The chain, chain gang was really a free black labor where they worked people and their their free time, I guess, was having them make these little leather wallets that they used to give away. When we went to visit, we would get a little leather wallet that my brother made. And um, but they did the road work. They did the the railroad stuff. They did all of the hard labor, and was easily as a black person you could end up there. So that was really um, very hard because we could, I I don't really know all the reasons why. You know, it made no sense because whites were in control and they decided whether you were guilty or not. There was no black voice into it. You know, Dad, another thing you kind of told me off and on throughout life is just uh, how, I guess, like, kind of like learning how to do things, especially like learning how to do stuff with your hands as like a matter of survival. Uh, you know, I think you talked about just like people kind of like coming through and like preying on the community with like charging, you know, these like super upcharge repairs and you know, all this type of stuff. Like, can you just talk about that a little bit? We were a lot of kids going to school. In the black schools, you took trades. Even if you were, quote, college bound, you took trades. You took plumbing, took electrical, auto mechanics, carpentry. You took trades because you had to do learn how to many times do your own things. Something went wrong, you need to either have a friend and you swapped. You know, you swapped your talents because if you called in the white firms, which most of the firms were, to come in and do stuff, sometimes you get charged double. And that was just a way of doing business. It did get down to a point also where the NAACP launched a boycott of the black auto dealers in Charleston because the dealers were charging black people uh, different prices for vehicles. So they had to, the only way to straighten that out was a boycott. Um, so you had all all of that going on. You had to set up your own community uh, services. So you would also, and this was not at all unusual, uh, a lot of your educated blacks were school teachers, male and female. They were school teachers, but those school teachers also had trades. So in their off hours, they would be doing things for one another. And that's basically, how a lot of us uh, survived as well as we did. Hmm. One thing that um, I thought was really great when I found out, first of all, Bruce and I left South Carolina at very different times. I was, uh, I left at junior high school age and he was there until he went away to college. But we blacks had to go to black doctors and I know in Sumter, we had one hospital and blacks could only go, they were all on one ward when, if something happened. If you had an accident, um, you were on that ward. If you had to have some emergency surgery, you were on the same ward. It didn't matter. The ironic thing though, is that black doctors couldn't work there at the hospital. So the doctors, your black doctor would have to turn you over to you over to a white doctor for you to get service at the hospital. And hmm. um, Bruce's grandfather, actually, well, Bruce the younger. <laughs> your grandfather, my dad, uh, got in with some doctors, black doctors in Charleston, and they made some connections politically. 
and they got some federal money and they built McLennan, McLennan Banks Memorial Hospital in Charleston because it was the same situation. If you were black and you got sick, you could go to you could go to the hospital except your doctor couldn't come treat you. So these people got together and got money from the feds and built a hospital that was dedicated and actually in June of 1959, McLennan Banks Hospital, so that the black doctors would have a place to practice. Now the oddball thing about this, or as coincidence may have it, when we came here, and Willie and I started going to church here in Oregon, um, there was a pastor, Thomasina Ewell. Well, it turned out that a member of Thomasina Ewell's family was one of the people in Charleston that worked with my father to get that hospital going. Hmm. It's, a, it's a small world. To that, small to world. that end, to that end, once you both kind of, obviously, mom, you hinted at that, you know, you left South Carolina at different times. You went to New Jersey. And I want to get into that in just a second. But dad, could you just talk about what brought you to Oregon of all places coming from South Carolina? <laughs> of all places. Okay, this goes back to another member of the family, Septima Poinsett Clark, who was well known in the civil rights movement along with Dr. King, Ralph Abernathy, and what have you. So Seppi came to Oregon at the request of Dr. Arthur Fleming, who at the time, and this was in the 60s, early 60s, mid 60s, Arthur Fleming was the president of the University of Oregon. So Seppi came out here to speak and what have you. And she was with the, um, basically with Highlander Folk School at the time, she was the, uh, head of education for Highlander Folk School. So anyway, she came out here on a speaking tour and got to know our new Arthur Fleming. And so in about 1966, she decided that Oregon would be a good place for me to go to school. Now at the time, I don't think she knew, and I certainly didn't know anything about the history of Oregon. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I found myself out here at Eugene, Oregon, going to the University of Oregon, not having a clue about what was the history, not only of Eugene, but of the entire state. So um, it was quite interesting. But going backwards again, which a lot of people don't know, is Arthur Fleming was the Secretary of Education under Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower actually was one of the supporters in the early days of the Civil Rights Bill. And Dwight, and so Eisenhower and King were together in a lot of things. And so that's how this whole thing kind of evolved and the relationship. So here I am in Eugene, Oregon, 1966. And you would have been like part of one of those first kind of like waves of black students at the time, right? So here's the other part of that. When I came to the University of Oregon, when I arrived, there was like six black students by the end of that academic year, the numbers mushroomed. There were a lot of programs that Dr. Fleming started at the U of O. One of them was by a friend of his by the name of Dr. Arthur Pearl. He brought Arthur Pearl out here from Washington, D.C. to do the Upward Bound program. And so that, in turn, a lot of Black people ended up at U of O. There was also another program called Job Corps. And there was a relationship between Upward Bound and Job Corps, which uh, the people in Astoria woke up one morning and found about 250 black people all of a sudden landed in their town. And so all of this was a period of time when we saw a significant rise in black students and educators in Oregon. Hmm. Yeah, and, you know, I, I imagine you know, you probably, I'm just curious, like how, you know, how the white people of Eugene responded to this influx in the, you know, 1960s. A few of them were, and this is interesting, a few of them were outrightly verbal about this happening. I would dare say there was a greater number that didn't, didn't say anything, but this was at the same time period 
It was about a year and a half later that the Black Panthers showed up at the University of Oregon. Now that got relatively exciting for the population because here were these people dressed in uh, somewhat um, military gear marching up and down the streets. But that, and that really kind of excited the town quite a bit. But that excitement didn't last too long. It was tempered because the Black Panthers got together with Dr. Wesley Nicholson of the United Church of Christ at that time, it's called the Congregational Church, of course, UCC, and the Black Panthers asked the church about starting a breakfast program for school kids. And when that started, all of a sudden the temperament against the Black Panthers kind of cooled. And that program was similar to other Black Panther programs throughout the nation. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, similar time, you're, you're in Eugene. Mom, you're in New Jersey. Uh, just talk, I know it's, it's almost like a whole other story in itself, <laughs> but you just talk about kind of like why, what brought you to New Jersey and then kind of you were working in education and you famous, well, work with the New famous Jersey. Joe Clark. Yes, that was part of my life in New Jersey. Um, but I went there as a, a, a kid <laughs> going into seventh grade because my sixth grade teacher in South Carolina hit me and with a leather strap because corporal punishment was allowed, but my mother did not allow anyone to hit me other than her. And she did her share of it. Um, I always thought I was an angel, but you didn't argue with my mother. Um, anyway, she um, had only a third grade education and my father and stepfather, both neither one of them um, could read or write. So I didn't come from a family of educators as uh, Bruce, your father's family is totally different. There's a lot of educators on that side and it would take a long time for us to go through all of the history. But she took a job as a sleep-in maid in New Jersey and um, had me stay with a friend for two months while she tried it out and then moved me to New Jersey and I lived in a rooming house um, and my mother only had Thursdays and every other Sunday off. So that was a whole different thing. Today, that would not be allowed, but I stayed with a family that she'd met from a church and she put that trust in me that I could handle myself and be responsible. And so I did that, went through school and after a while there, we were able to get low income housing um, in the projects where I stayed in the projects until the end of my first year of, co of college. And at that time, my mother decided she would move back home because she'd made a big sacrifice. She would move back home to be with her husband that she had sacrificed for me. So I feel really, it's very, when I talk about it, it's my mother did a lot anyway. That's another story that we can do for another time. Mm -hmm. But I went to school um, at a local school, Patterson State College at the time. It's a university now, but I wanted to work in Port in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, and I wanted to work in a low income school that had black kids. And so I got my wish and I was a teacher at school number six. And then after a while, I became a vice principal at school number six. And then I went with Joe Clark, the infamous Joe Clark with the bullhorn. Um, he and I taught together. And when he was appointed principal, he wanted me to be his vice principal. And I was at another school at the time. And so then I went to Eastside High School with him. And so that movie, Lean on Me, mm -hmm. um, while it was made after I moved out here, it uh, a lot of the the vice principal uh, portrayal had to do with things that I did there. So yes, I'm I'm I had that opportunity, but 
I that's my passion. I've always wanted to work with people that had challenges, in particular my black people in, and people who did not have a lot of education. And um, I've been working. It's around race too, because that's really what what started it all. The lack of opportunity for people. That was my that was my life. And I would like to fight to make that change. I could go on and on, so let me stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that kind of just brings me to my next thing about, you know, I'm curious with both of you as far as like navigating like professionally in Oregon, you know, obviously like dad, you were, you know, you were in college here and then kind of mom, you more so, you know, you met dad and then you came over here and kind of like jumped right into the, you know, being an administrator in PPS. But can you just, uh, yeah, both of you talk about, I know, let's start with dad because I know one, another story you kind of told me is just like how basically they were betting against you when they hired you and having to, you know, as like just a black person in your field, could you just, can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, I'll bring you up to date with that. Um, came out here and went to school, had to eat like everybody else. Got to meet a guy who was a automobile salesman in Springfield, Oregon, selling Buicks. Got to know him real well and he kind of opened some doors for me. And um, time went on and it was partly because of him and the owner of the dealership that I ended up working for State Farm Insurance of all people and went through the underwriting pro training program and the claims training program. And this was back in actually 1971. But in 1973, as State Farm was changing over to from field staff to office staff, and that's a story unto itself, uh, an opportunity came up with the state of Oregon. And at that time, I knew the affirmative actions director for the state of Oregon. And so Harold called me up one day and he says, we've got an interesting situation that would really fit you well. I said, well, that's interesting. Come in, let's talk about it. And Harold explained, he says, well, in actuality, you do have a construction background. You know about construction, you're interested in that. Uh, the state is hiring uh, safety compliance people to monitor construction sites for safety violations. And uh, they have an excellent training program. I'd like to get you into that. So mm, that sounded real good. So I went and met with him, took the civil service exam, and Harold took me over to the Department of Labor and Industries to meet the people with the group that administered safety in the state of Oregon. So it was kind of hard to tell the affirmative actions director that the person he's bringing to go to work for you isn't qualified, but you know, got the job, no problem. Now, the, the truth of the matter was, um, I was the first black construction compliance officer ever in state history. There were some existing staff and some people on the other side who just kind of figured that there was no way in the world I was ever gonna survive or stay in that position. There's no way in the world I could learn what was necessary and all of the things to, to be a compliance officer. And that was in 1973. Well, I did go through all the ranks of being a compliance officer. So in 1982, I was promoted from compliance officer to consultant. And here again, there were people in consultation. That's a different kind of a thing. You're not writing citations. You're advising people on safe practices. They figured, well, you know, I'd last a year or two and then I'd be gone. This is some of the same group that when I went into compliance, they figured he would, I would never last, I'd be gone. So, well, that didn't happen, became a consultant. Well, I went through the ranks of consultation and in 1986, I got picked up by Liberty Mutual Insurance to be a consultant to their accounts. That was interesting. A few people at Liberty figured, well, no way in the world a black person could ever last at this. And lo and behold, in uh, 1989, I left Liberty and went to work for the Associated General Contractors of America as a consultant in safety. Now, the oddball thing about that is that transition 
the insurance program for Liberty was being, or for AGC, was being handled by Liberty. So I was still in a, technically an employee of Liberty. But the point of the matter was, all along the line, there were people who had never encountered Black people in safety to begin with. That was number one. So the fact that I remained in the field uh, for as long as I have, which I'm still in the field, uh, it was kind of amazing to a lot of folks. Why don't you tell them about the experience when you were a compliance officer and the person ignored you? This was um, <laughs> one of the things that happened, which was really quite noteworthy, uh, was you go out, you see somebody doing something wrong. In this particular case, there was actually a person in a trench, a couple of people in a trench um, that was quite deep, and the trench was not made safe for them to enter. In other words, they took some shortcuts. They didn't shore it up so it wouldn't cave in. Okay, so they're in there. I catch them. Uh, I show my identification, ask them to come out of the hole, and explain to them that their employer is going to get cited. Now, they're fully aware. I've given them business cards and what have you. The employer gets the citation. The um, employer is not believing what's going on either, so he asks for a formal hearing. This is when you go to court to try to plead your case and appeal. Well, to make a long story short, we ended up in court. States were represented by the Deputy Attorney General, and we're sitting in the, in the hearings room, and the employer is represented by their attorney. So the deputy turns to me and he says, how should we go about this? I said, look, you get both of those guys on the stand, just ask them point blank why they were working in an unsure trench. They'll sing like a bird, we'll be out of here in no time flat. They got them on the stand and these clowns said, well, the reason we stayed in, the reason we didn't know our union had not informed us that the state of Oregon hired Negro inspectors. That was their excuse. Very sad excuse, but that's that's what that's what happened. Total, total amazement, you know, just wow, wow. So yeah, mom, can you talk about, you know, you came to Portland, it would have been nineteen eighty four, eighty five, eighty six. Eighty six. Eighty six. So yeah, can you just talk about, you know, going from going from New Jersey to PPS and kind of like what that transition was like? Like how were, you know, when you actually could you tell a story about like how you even got the job in the first place? I think it's a <laughs> well, I applied for the job. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about Portland. The only person I knew was Bruce. When I came out and uh, when I had spring break, well, we knew that we were getting married that summer. So during spring break, I came out um, to look for a job. I had actually sent an application in and heard absolutely nothing from Portland Public Schools. So I did what I guess sometimes people say, will say, I put on my best looking suit, put on my little heels, got myself dressed up, and I went down to the headquarters, the, the main building for Portland Public Schools, went to personnel and just asked directly, you know, I told them I'm here, here, I live in New Jersey, I'm visiting and I've applied and I haven't heard anything. And so the person behind the, the window there tried to explain the site, the process to me, except I didn't want to hear about the process. I wanted to um, speak with someone and I insisted on speaking to the personnel director. So after a while, they finally allowed me. She went left and talked and she allowed me to speak to the uh, personnel director. And I talked to her for a long time and um, for like an informal interview. And she said, I want someone else to meet you. And so um, she invited the deputy superintendent to come down. 
and he came down and asked me questions and we had a nice, you know, informal interview, I thought. Um, they said, well, we would really like to have you, but this is the process is different. We have to wait to see what happened to openings and they went through everything. But at any rate, I thought I was going to get the job, but I didn't hear anything. He said, you won't hear until June. So in June, um, I got a call after I, I asked him, my things were on the truck on the way out to Oregon. So, you know, I had a great faith that I was going to get a job. And I got a call first from my superintendent um, back in Patterson telling me he had gotten the call from someone, from the deputy superintendent, and that I would be getting a call from him. And I got a call, my maiden name was Davis, and he said, Miss Davis. And he went on to identify himself and said, we'd like to offer you a position. And I said, thank you, you know, my stuff is on the way to Oregon right now, so thank you. And I got a job and I was ignored by the folks, I had other administrators. I would go to meetings and really have people talk about me being from the outside and um, coming in and taking jobs from people who had been here and have paid their dues and didn't get the job. And so I hope that culture has changed. <laughs> That's all mm -hmm. I can say. I hope that I understand what they're saying, but we have to open up. You know, I, I had a good, hard experience working in Portland, but I worked there for 26 years and 19 years in New Jersey. So I think putting in 45 years in education was a good run. You know, I, I will say that you know, one of the things I am genuinely proud of as a son is that I, I run into people to this day who, you know, they see my name and maybe they had you as a principal at some point. And it's like, I run into people who sing your praises to me and I don't have anything to offer them. You know, there's no, they don't have to do it, but something you did like touch them to the point where it's like, they remember 15, 20 years later. And, you know, like I said, it's just something, you know, I have to be like, I'm proud that that's my mother who did that. And I, my guess for, you know, some of that, and I want to divulge too much of your business, but I will say that, you know, I got to see you do a lot of things that went far beyond your job description in terms of like supporting and, you know, helping out some of the families you worked with that, like I said, again, I can't get into specifics. I don't want to put people's business out there, but I think people remember that. I think, you know, doing, it's not lost on me, the importance of sometimes saying, you know, identifying what needs to be done and just saying, I'm going to do this. And I think it's also a source of why the two of us sometimes have disagreements because I am my mother's child at times, <laughs> but we won't get into that on this either. Um, you know, but I can oh. tell you, you know, my, my giving is only because that's how I was raised. People gave me, gave my mother, gave us. Doors opened for us as poor people, as uneducated folks there. I mean, doors opened for us. We didn't have the luxuries, the, the comforts of um, things up. Uh, I, I mean, that's both good and bad for me as an adult. Um, I will tell you, I remember my mother had to go away for, she was a midwife also, and she had to go away for two weeks of training. And one of my teachers said I could come and stay with her for two weeks. I couldn't believe it. So from out of the country, I went to the city and I saw, oh my God, she had this this china and she had crystal and she had all these nice things and I said I have to get them well 
there's a downside to that story is because when I was able to afford things, I bought them and I became a pack rat of collecting things, but it was because I never had it. And I wanted to be like other people. So I'm going to put a positive spin on that because I can see, you know, one of the things that I know you collected, especially when I was growing up, was black art, you know, and for people who've been to, you know, my parents' house before, they will notice, you know, a lot of black art, a lot of, you know, black books, and I bring that up specifically because I want to talk about, you know, Lake Oswego and the decision of, like, you know, Deciding to build a home in Lake Oswego and why, but also kind of like both the the positives and the negatives and things that you know. I think uh, you know, I was having a conversation with you know some students and alumni earlier about this, like as a uh, you know, the children of some of this, like it's kind of like it can be complicated for us because we feel like we're caught in between. So sometimes I don't think like we have these like conversations with our parents about, you know, again, what worked, what didn't, what did we learn? How do, you know, what do we do moving forward? And we're gonna talk about respond to racism as well. But I just wanna, you know, ask you all for this conversation, like one, uh, why, you know, when you made the decision, why Lagos we go and kind of like what, what have your takeaways kind of been both the good and the bad from this experience? Well, I want to um, let your dad talk more because when we looked at houses, I guess he heard from a friend and he can tell you about that part, um, whose best friend and her husband owned this house and wanted to sell it. So that's how we got to Lake Oswego because we had looked around in Tigard and Beaverton Right, and hadn't found anything. But along the way, sometimes you need your allies to be able to open doors for you. And so I said, don't shut the door. Don't come out, you know, and, and say, you know, I, I don't like this group of people. I don't like someone else because you never know who's going to open the door for you. And that's what happened. That's how we ended up here. A white ally, someone that we met just in dealing with the house that opened doors because at the time I looked at this house, I didn't have a job, which meant we, we couldn't get a mortgage. I had to get a job. And this gentleman worked it out, opened the doors and found those little, little holes, loopholes that are there that you can work around. And so that's what makes me also angry because I see so many people that when you can't get a loan or you can't get a house, you look at the the racism that's in the, and, and the, just the, the stuff that happens to people and particularly people of color. And I say, Thank you to the allies that we have. We need some more. It's unfortunate with that we have to have that kind of system, but it is what it is until we can make it different. And so being open, um, I, I always have to keep in mind, I didn't get here by myself. There were people helping me get up that ladder. And so whether it was education or housing or putting food, there were people who gave me food. There were people who bought meals for me. And I thank them because I wouldn't be where I am. I have to give back. So I have, yeah, I need to chime in too. Just back up a moment. Um, Willie talked about the first school in Portland, which happened to be in the St. John's neighborhood. The interesting thing is at that time period, the St. John's neighborhood was a little on the rough side, you know, and what have you. 
Um, so when she came to Portland, they were assigned, they assigned her to James John Elementary. When I came to work for the state of Oregon, I too was assigned to the St. John's area because in industry, the St. John's area was the most dangerous. And so someone figured that if I could survive working in St. John's, being a black compliance officer in St. John's, and I might just might be able to stick around. And I succeeded and everything, you know, got to know people, did my job in St. John's and kept going from there. Okay, now let's go forward and talk about allies. Talk about getting the house. When you got the, the white car, you remember when you got that white Lexus? Mm -hmm. That came from an ally, a family that I got to know in Springfield, Oregon, put that deal together. That car came from somebody that we knew who bought it brand new. And you at the time needed another car. And it just so happened that it showed up on the market. You know, it showed up. It wasn't even on the market. It showed up. And I remember we went to see it. And then another time we took delivery because the people brought it in so you could drive it. And then later on, of course, when they got their new car, we got it. They're relationships. They're always relationships that are important. They're beneficial. So that goes on along with everything else. Yeah. So again, can you just like as far as the experience of, you know, these past what was it since eighty six at least, you know, it's almost, you know, a few few decades in LO. Again, I guess like what in terms of like lessons you would take both of those like what's been positive, what's been negative, it's, you know, yeah. Like what can you like take away from, you know, being here. here? Yeah. Especially since retirement, cause I actually got a chance to really live here mm -hmm. and, you know, be here. Um, I discovered um, the level of racism I, I wasn't tuned in before, um, but I discovered the level of racism, but I also discovered that there was um, a lot of people who just didn't know. They didn't know what they didn't know. And there were people that knew there was racism, but wanted and wanted to fight it. And so I think the, the, when respond to racism came about that it was it was time it was time for a change i'm seeing little changes but movement that wasn't moving before hmm. well, can we just back talking. up just a just a second since we are talking about respond so for those who don't know, Respond to Racism, like Oswego, it's a grassroots anti-racism organization formed in summer of 2017, among other things. Well, one, my mother is the uh, co-founder and the current president of the organization. And we, you know, we do a number of things, including you know, hosting monthly meetings, having uh, demonstrations, bear, you know. Uh, engaging with the city, the school district, various local institutions, and in, you know a variety of ways. So I just want to give that context. But uh, for you specifically, you know, I, I want to not so much talk about like the story of how it formed, but why you, you know, when that you know 2017, you know, when Liberty reached out to you, the other uh, co-founder of the group, why like jumping into like respond specifically like what really uh what lit your fire to say i gotta i have to do this and i have to you know like especially like in retirement you know take on this thing that has basically become you know a full-time job for you now <laughs> well liberty reached out to me well not just me she reached out to all of us that were talking about what had happened in Lake Oswego 
and Liberty offered to provide a place for us to sit down, talk, and she would facilitate uh, a meeting. A lot of people were on the call, on the line with next door, saying, telling and sharing stories about race and racism or sharing stories that they didn't see it. They didn't feel that there was racism in uh, Lake Oswego. However, I was the only person who responded to Liberty's call. Liberty and I met and I said, I shared with Liberty that I'd been in civil rights movement. I've been an activist like for years. And I said, let's put it out again, put it out from both of us with a little about each one of us. And that was what brought the first meeting of 66 people to sit down and talk about race and racism in Lake Oswego. And we've been going ever since. So um, I don't know, I can't, I just can't stop. Liberty has relocated um, to Minnesota, but the work goes on here. We got, she relocated in 2018 and I've continued with the team of volunteers to do the work. There's a lot to be done and I am very happy with the reception. Now, not everybody in Lake Oswego is on board. Not a, not, not a, I mean, I would be crazy to think that we had suddenly turned the whole city around and everybody, you know, we were all going in the same direction. No, no. There's a lot of work to be done still. Mm -hmm. So can I, uh, at the risk, uh, I was not going to, you're giving me that look. But I'm just going to say, you know, when we talk about uh, what has changed in Lake Oswego, even if some of it is only, you know, aesthetic, or it's just like, you know, it's the first person hired to this position and whatnot. But um, yeah, how, in terms of just like your feelings around how things are going, like the substance versus, in some cases, I'm just call it the performance. So I, a lot of it is, um, and listening to Aaron Jones, who was the keynote speaker for the summit that was held yesterday, um, I realized we, we we're at that stage. We we're at that performative stage still. Um, they're going to hire their first DEI person for the city, and so we're going through that those stages. But we at least are starting to move. Before there was um this feeling that everything was okay in Lake Oswego and um it wasn't everything was okay for some people but not all and a lot of people were not happy and a lot of people were not welcome in the city I mean my last I had a conversation with the mayor talking about low-income housing and I was like oh my goodness I can't believe that Lake Oswego would even entertain that thought, but it's going to be a fight. But there's a desire to to um, offer moderate and low income housing, so that people can live here. As you know, I tell people when we bought our house, it was cheap. Um, it's not, you know, the value has gone up a lot. And I wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to buy this house today. It's, mm. you know, it's a 35 years later, it's a different market. You know, I think that that kind of speaks to, you know, when we talk about what's coming down the pipe, what's, you know, what are the next things, right? You know, like affordable housing is up there, I think. You know, obviously in the schools, there's a lot of mobilization right now around curriculum, around hiring, 
And like another thing I think about is infrastructure. And, you know, there's been some conversations that have been kind of shut down or proposals that have been more or less shut down around, you know, creating a walking bridge, for example, between uh, Lake Oswego and Oak Grove or, you know, TriMet lines into LO and things like that. And even like access to opening up access to Lake Oswego to, you know, basically people not on the lake. And, you know, some of the, uh, some of the pushback we've seen is not, it's not very coded. <laughs> like it's basically people saying, oh my goodness, if you do this, then you're going to let these, these scary poor people in, or you're going to let black and brown people in. And then what will we do? But no, the word is, as one gentleman told me in the, in the meeting, the riffraff right. from Portland <laughs> in. But that's another conversation on another day because, uh, well, not unfortunately, unfortunately that we will have to cut our conversation short today. And I would like to answer questions from anybody that's in the audience. We're sorry. Um, Thank you for taking, we, taking control of... <laughs> <laughs> I, that is my mother taking over take, again right <laughs> take, take it control but we have uh, a, we show, have a meditation but, uh... walk that starts at four o'clock and so we have to be down town for a silent meditation walk um in protest of what's happening racism okay so uh, i apologize nope we're, we're gonna keep that in the video too because it's funny